I think by, uh, by your being here and all of us, we understand that buildings are important and we don't take them for granted. But I think a lot of people do. And uh, we want to help change that. Buildings uh, are so much a part of our lives, obviously. Some say we spend, EPA actually says we spend about 90% of our time in buildings. Um, they use 40% of our energy use, or we use 40% of the energy use by operating buildings. That's just building operation. That's not for the materials. Uh, and they affect so much of our lives, health, comfort. Uh, and so we have a wonderful panel today, and I'm so grateful for, uh, for all of them being here to talk about the solutions. Uh, and the Building Technologies Office in the U.S. Department of Energy is really our greatest resource for researching, developing building technologies and sort of how to put them together and helping uh, builders and uh, uh, designers uh, use best practices and teach them how to use some of the new advanced materials. Uh, because buildings are more complicated than a, than a very complicated 3D puzzle. Uh, and so it's, it's a critical, critical part of our economy, the building sector. So thank you again for being here. Uh, my name is Ellen Vaughn, and I uh, focus on buildings for the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. Uh, so I'm delighted to introduce our panel, and I want to get started right on that. Uh, our first uh, speaker is Roland Risser, and Mr. Risser is the Director of the Building Technologies Office in the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy, DOE. And he directs the work to help create a self-sustaining market for building energy efficiency. I think that's a very critical statement because buildings are, uh, because this is, this is a huge part of our economy. Um, BTO is focused on achieving a 50% reduction on energy use in buildings by optimizing uh, all of those uh, energy saving opportunities. Prior to DOE, uh, Roland served as the Director of Customer Energy Efficiency for Pacific Gas and Electric Company, PG&E, in California, where he directed its energy efficiency and demand response programs and he managed building and appliance codes and standards work. And he did a lot of things at PG&E that I probably won't get into all the, them all. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science from the University of California at Irvine, a Master of Science from uh, Cal Poly State University, and is a graduate of the Haas School of Business Executive Program at UC Berkeley. So please, Help me welcome Roland Risser. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? So I'm going to click in here. Hopefully this works. Which way am I going? So now maybe it'll work. Okay, so I want to start out with the ERE mission uh, for the part of DOE, and it's, uh, you can see the mission up on this uh, slide. I think one of the things that uh, on the bottom of this slide that's important to understand is we are looking at how to also break down the barriers to the market entry, and you'll, you'll hear as we talk about this particular topic area that they are quite immense in the building sector. Ellen mentioned the goal. 50% goal is a very big goal. We actually believe it is achievable. I set this goal in 2010 when I first started in the, in the program. It was based upon an analytical framework of the opportunity in this space. Now, I have to point out it was based upon a budget which was significantly larger than I, than I have today. And so I've taken out the date at which I will achieve this goal because, of course, it depends on how you drive forward on all of the technology solutions you're trying to do. The goal is still there and we're still trying, uh, we're still working toward it. Uh, let, me, let me say one more thing about this. Buildings, we're talking about residential buildings, we're talking about commercial buildings, we're talking about new construction, we're talking about retrofits, we're talking about five climate zones, 
We're talking about construction types that are masonry, wood, metal frame, etc. We're talking about commercial building type uh, sectors like retail, uh, wholesale, uh, uh, religious uh, service uh, uh, buildings, uh, hospitals. So you understand the diversity of government buildings. Uh, you understand the diversity of the types of buildings you have to deal with. And now let's layer on the technologies. We're looking at electric and gas technologies. We're looking at technologies for HVAC, for uh, lighting, for envelope. And then we're looking at things like data centers and we're looking at food service. So all that is a whole lot of technologies. If I was working on solar, I'd have one or two technologies and all the buildings are the same as far as the technology. All you just have is different attachments. So it, I'm just trying to make sure you appreciate the diversity of what's required to be successful. Okay, I've created a, a little, I call an ecosystem for BTO, which is how do the pieces fit together? You innovate on the technology front, you figure out how to get it into the market at speed and scale, and when you do so, you have an opportunity to create uh, minimum performance standards for cost-effective solutions. I think that's really important to understand. It has to be cost-effective. Budgets. Uh, if you go back to 2012, it was 220, 204, 178, 172. Bad trend. Uh, you can see the current proposal. I, you know, we all, none of us know what budgets are going to be, but our budget proposal is based upon this set of numbers. And you'll, uh, I can break it down for you. There's a slide later on, but there's a plus up in the emerging technologies, uh, residential, and uh, on the code side. So we'll hear about those in a minute. Now this slide talks about funding opportunities. One of the things I've been really trying to push is how do I get the market to bring better ideas in that I can uh, advance, often using laboratory expertise to get it uh, done faster and, and, uh, and using some of their particular expertise in testing and then get it back into the market. I'm going to talk about these in more detail, but I'm giving you an overview of what the areas are. So now let's drive the innovation side. So for 2016, the topics on the left are the topics of one of our funding opportunities. Now you might say, wait a minute, you mentioned a whole bunch of other topics, what about those? The way I've done it is I've broken it into three chunks, and every year I do one of those groups, and then the next year I do the next group, and the third year I do the next group, and then by the fourth year I'm back to the first group, and that allows me to, to fund for multiple years of research and then keep all of the technology areas moving. Okay, uh, I want to give you a couple examples. What worked? Okay, it's not about here's what we're going to do. This is what we did. So this is the technology. It's refrigeration. Refrigeration is on 24/7, 365 days a year. Uh, it's like in grocery stores. You don't want to go and have it heat up in the night when you're not there. It's 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 cooling all the time. We've got a technology we helped develop with uh, this company and Oak Ridge that is 25 more efficient than 25 percent more efficient than anything else on the market, and 75, 78 percent fewer greenhouse gas emissions. They're now selling these into the market. Uh, it was just finished in 2014, so that's pretty quick. They're getting them back into the market. Dow, another company, we work with them on a, a sprayable sealant. The problem with sealants is they put. Uh, they can, they can put some on where you, you cock them on or you put uh, some sort of material on and there's often a gap. So this was a, a way to get at places where they're really hard to seal. It's a much better sealant. Uh, we just finished this in 14 and now we're trying to, again, move that into the market, showing the opportunity for lower cost, lower risk uh, options for builders. Okay, now this one. Um, these are two big high opportunity areas. The top one is non-vapor compression. You probably may or may not know what that is, but most refrigeration today uses a compressor to compress a cooling fluid that it compresses it down and then it lets it, uh, it relieves the pressure and it's a, it's a cooling cycle that it goes through for like your refrigerator or your air conditioner. So what about a cooling solution that never uses a compressor and doesn't have any of the global warming potential cooling fluids that are in your refrigerator or your air conditioner. You know that if that gets out into the atmosphere, that's a big problem for global warming. Well, we have done some work on some of these. We've got two solutions that are currently being built for sale. 
We've proven them out. Two major companies, one of them GE, and they are really, really interesting. So what we want to do is go out after more of this. We'd like to see U.S. competitiveness in this particular area because we believe this is the future. It's going to change the design of your refrigerator. Think about a refrigerator you can't hear. Think about an air conditioner you can't hear. I know mine drives me crazy. It's outside the uh, family room window. But that's, that's where we think this is heading, and we like to make some, some direct uh, investments in that space. The second one has to do with the building envelope. Biggest challenge for buildings is it either keeps out what you want in or keeps in what you want out. So how can you create a membrane or an envelope that allows you to get rid of the things you don't want and let in the things you want? And a perfect example is you want heat in the winter and you don't want it in the summer. So there's some solutions in that space. Uh, we'd, we'd like to uh, invest in more of those. Lighting. Lighting is a huge opportunity for us. Uh, I use this example uh, because our lighting program has had consistent funding and we've consistently driven efficiency in this space. Uh, I like to say there's a little bit of DOE investment in almost every major product, uh, lighting product, uh, LED product on the market. If you go back to FY13, our goal was 111 um, lumens per dollar. We hit 115. I'm sorry, in 13. In 14, it was 128. We hit 150. Now in 15, we're trying to hit 160. So we're, we're getting these goals. If you get more light for the same amount of money, it's more efficient. And these are better quality light as well. So let's look at what that did. So the deployment, if you look over the last uh, six years or so, you can see we've gone from uh, about less than 400,000 LEDs to 34 million LEDs. And that's, you can see the slope of the price coming down and the slope of the sales going up. The bad news is we're only at 4%. We're only at 4% of the market. But look at what the top line there is, the smartphone. Smartphone is one of the fastest market uh, evolution technologies ever. It's at 7%. LEDs is at 4%. That is pretty darn good. Look at CFLs. It's less than 0.1% over six years. That shows you what LEDs are doing. But if we're at 4% of the market, think of what opportunities we have for huge savings going forward if we can get solutions at the right price in more applications. Okay, now let's go on. Our solid state lighting proposal for 16 is 21 million in the solid state lighting program. We actually are gonna spend closer to 26 million on solid state lighting. If you look at the bottom, the 4.8 difference, what we did is we said, why should we spend money in the solid state lighting technology program on deployment when we have a mechanism in the deployment program to take those technologies and move them into the market. And in a minute, I'll show you how successful that was. Accelerate to scale. So here's the example. So we took solid state lighting and we said, you know what? This technology is pretty good for certain applications. Parking lots is a perfect example. We put together a set of specifications, technical specifications for parking lot lights with those companies with millions of square feet of parking lots. They agreed to the spec. We went to the manufacturers and they said, this is what we want to buy. Guess what? If the manufacturers have a single spec, their costs are lower. Their prices are lower. Prices went down, they started buying volume. Prices went down again, they went into greater volumes. We've sold uh, 480 million square feet of parking lot lighting on our goal to be at 500 million by March. Uh, I think we're going to get there. It's 10 million annual savings. You can see how a, because we're using an existing deployment structure, this is how government can help markets really move uh, at scale. Next uh, technology is successful is uh, modeling. So modeling, if you go back 10 years, you're going to say, who uses our DO2 or in that case, Energy Plus? Universities and national labs. And I said, where's the market? Why isn't the market using it? Well, they said it's slow, it's clunky, it's not very user friendly. And uh, by the way, it's written in Fortran. I did my master's thesis in Fortran. <laughs> that is like ancient. And we had to pay all these Fortran programmers to do the updates. That's silly. We've converted it to C++. We've sped up the processing. We've made, put in a user interface that's easy for anyone to use. We now have 20 thousand users of these models. Train, Carrier, Autodesk, it's built into their solution sets. I have NR Canada who now is using it instead of what they were using before because they said 
Yours is better. We'd like to use your solution. So this example of how you transform the market. Next one is um, small and medium commercial building. The hardest market to go after because you've got a dry cleaners, you've got a uh, uh, hairdresser, you have a nail salon, you, they're all just a plethora of different businesses. There's no energy manager there. The owner is the salesperson, the marketing person, and the energy manager. So you've got to make it really simple for them. You've got to make it work easily. So we've got a focused effort on trying to get at solutions that are scalable in this space, and that's one of the, uh, the FOAs uh, we have here. Now, the one thing I would say is, okay, you might say, well, how do you do that, or what, what would that look like? We funded one last year. It's with Equal Partners from Florida. They basically are designing prepackaged um, retrofit solutions for specific markets in specific climate zones for specific store types. And they're just, that way you can just scale it across all of those store types. That's the kind of solution that work for them. Because if you walk in and try to do something custom, they can't afford to listen to you or buy it. Okay, next is uh, a uh, home uh, project. These are just examples. This is attic insulation that came out of the Building America program. We have 42 really cool innovations. This is one of them. And you might say, well, who cares about attic insulation? Well, if you look at HUD code, the the uh, R factor is 22. That's the, the insulation factor. If you look at Energy Star Homes, it's 30 to 38. This delivered 44 to 54. It's a simple, simple solution that they came up with. Now they just have to scale it, but it works very well. Uh, next is our, so our Building America FOA for this next round. And what we did is we were funding maybe 30 or 40 different technologies out of this program in the past. I said, focus on three big wins. You can't move 34 things. Find three big wins. So the big wins are right here listed on there. If we can solve those for different building types and climate zones, you have made a huge inroad for both uh, new construction and residential retrofit uh, area. And I think uh, Jay's going to tell us if he agrees with that in a minute. Uh, OK, here's one of the challenges I had with our residential program. We focused on whole house retrofits. OK. That's the most cost-effective thing you can do is to retrofit your entire home. How many people do that? Or shall I say, how many people will do it twice? Uh, it's not a fun thing if you've ever done it. Very few people can afford to do that home all at once. So what they do is they go in and they put in new windows and new insulation. And then when they get a little more money, they go in and they put a new HVAC system. And then when they get a little more money, they do something else. We have to structure our program to align with how people buy this service and deliver the service. So we're completely changing our thinking. We're calling it staged upgrades, and we have a plan on how to get into the market at scale in this, in this area. Okay, the last part of our program is our standards program. This is in statute. There's a climate action plan goal that you can't get there without this program. It's how we're delivering on the administration's goal. And by the way, it's legally required. When we didn't do this some time ago, we got taken to court and told, you must do it. All, we get taken to court when we do it as well, but uh, uh, it's just the way of the business. Okay, uh, next slide is, okay, I, I, this mentions the, the cleaner, uh, the uh, climate action plan goal of 3 billion metric tons. We're now at 2.2. The number I like is the $480 billion. I'm about money. I want to save people money. That's what I'm, what's driving me. Of course, I want the climate uh, protection to come with it. But, if, but I want to do it at a, a lower cost to the U.S. consumer. This next slide has to do with codes. The main point here is if I go out and I say, if you, Arizona, or you, Louisiana, want to, to uh, get higher compliance with your commercial building codes, I have no way to tell them what it's worth, what they can do, and what savings they can get. I have no way to tell them that. There's nothing quantitative out there anywhere to do that. Started on the residential side. I'm on a three year plan to do it. The, the funding is in place, and we're doing it in seven states right now on the residential side. I'm going to do the same thing on the commercial side. So, if someone wants to make an investment, let's say it's a utility incentive program, they know if they do X, they can get this kind of benefits. And there's a quantifiable methodology that they will be able to follow. So, that's the purpose of that uh, FOA. Uh, this shows an example of that ecosystem I told you. I mentioned lighting in our research there. 
That rolled into that lighting campaign where we have almost 500 million square feet installed, which now has, is, has promoted an ASHRAE 90.1, which is the commercial code, um, code update, which again would be a voluntary option that people can do in order to meet that code. This shows how that cycle really works. Okay, smart buildings. Uh, this is a different topic, uh, one that I think is, is growing in interest across the country, and it's the last thing I'm going to mention. What, do I, what am I talking about here? Well, if you look at a building, it has embedded infrastructure that is only used for the thing it was bought for and not for other things it might do. Uh, in a few cases, utilities have demand response programs where they, they shut something down and get a benefit, give a benefit back to the consumer. There's a huge amount of benefit in those, that equipment that is not being realized. And part of the reason it's not being realized is there's no way to quantify it in a standardized way. We're changing that. So what are we doing? One, we're creating a characterization framework for how you would characterize a piece of equipment for the value proposition it could provide back to the utility or to another building. And if you standardize it, anybody who builds a piece of equipment or sells a piece of equipment or buys a piece of equipment knows what they're buying. That yellow label you see on your refrigerator or on your dishwasher, that's based upon DOE data that the FTC puts on that equipment. I'm just thinking of a similar way where you can characterize that equipment and know what it can do for you. That allows someone to make a choice. I could buy this piece of equipment, and uh, someone who's marketing to them can say, well, if you buy this more one with better controls on it, you can actually sell back to the utility. This is their, their tariff scheme, and you can make um, an extra thousand dollars a year credit on your bill. Now, why would the utility do that? Well, the utility likes it because they have a big problem. Their big problem is they are, they have to manage the peak on the system, and they have another problem, which is growing amount of intermittent renewable generation. Those create costs to the utility. We've proven that if you can use equipment already in place in your building, you have the right sensors and controls, you can reduce the cost to the utility and reduce the cost to the consumer. That's what we're after, and that's what we're trying to do. It's, it, it's primarily creating an interoperability platform. I can give you examples of where we've done that. We've got multiple commercial enterprises now working with us on this, and it's in place in about seven utilities in pilots um, in the Pacific Northwest. Last slide is just the summary budget slide for EERE. Uh, you can see our summary numbers on there. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for that great overview. And each one of those items could probably, we could go on and on, right? So that, that <laughs> uh, I would love to do that, actually. Um, but. Um, that was, that was terrific to see uh, all those uh, important programs. And it really is so much uh, for, for the budget. Um, it's a bargain, right? Thank you again. Uh, so with that overview of the, of the BTO program, the different programs under it, and looking at the budget, the FY16 budget, we're now going to move to uh, Jay Murdoch with Owens Corning, who will provide um, an industry perspective, uh, and in this case, working with DOE and um, uh, helping the building industry uh, make building better buildings. So Jay is director of government relations, government and public affairs. Sorry, for Owens Corning. Uh, after attending architecture school, Jay worked in commercial construction and was a residential builder and remodeler. So he's he's been there. He knows he knows the real deal. Uh, he also worked for the Building Owners and Managers Association, the Federal U.S. Access Board, and the National Association of Home Builders. Um, on the Americans with Disabilities Act, fair housing, building codes, and policy. And I am so glad Jay could join us today. Please help me welcome Jay Murdoch. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. I don't have any slides uh, for my presentation. I just want to try to uh, paint a picture. I'm going to focus mostly on residential, new construction. Um, I think what, what I touch here on the residential side has um, correlates to the commercial sector as well. Um, I am a recovering home builder. I <laughs> uh, had a nice head of hair um, before I uh, went to home building. And the one thing that I went back to tell some of my um, professors was that uh, you, when you go into residential remodeling, you need a course on marriage counseling because <laughs> <laughs> you are, you are uh, in awkward situations to navigate a minefield. But that also applies to any work that you know, all of these guys deal with every day. It's varied interests, varied relationships, varied levels of emotion, in fact, that you're dealing with. Um, so I want to try to paint a picture around uh, what my fr friends in the home building industry face all the time. And that has to do with, um, you know, I want to paint a picture of what they deal with. So if you can imagine a home builder create a little pie chart in your head around what they have to do to get to building a house. They have to acquire the land. They have to find financing for that. They have to get approvals from state and local governments. Uh, they have to come up with a design, crystal ball gazing, that will actually appeal to the buyer two years in advance. Um, they have labor issues and they have design issues. So in that pie chart of priorities for the builder, monetize, building codes that very thin little line in that whole pie chart. Not to diminish the value of building codes because they deal with life safety and fire safety. But even within that thin line, regrettably, the energy code is kind of an orphan in that whole scheme. Now we're all pretty much probably advocates for energy efficiency here, as am I. So I don't want to send the wrong message out, but I need to give you context of what's in the lens uh, for the home building. So that's the 80-20 goal for the home builders. So we had the Great Recession and really discovered the home builders a little bit earlier. 2006, 2007, the wheels started falling off the new construction housing market. What happens in that situation is that all the intellectual capital and smarts that had grown organically in a home builder's, home builder's business um, went away because you had to cut people or you went out of business. So that intellectual capital that we had grown up over the 2000s and the 1990s basically went away. So as um, so that doesn't just, just the home builder and the supervisor on the field. That applies to all their trades. That framing contractor, um, I I had the veins to get out of my neck when I was uh, paying my trim carpenter for all the mistakes that my foundation guy did, did wrong and my framing uh, contractor did wrong. So. In that whole um, situation for the framing contractor, a good framing contractor will do know how to do fire blocking and draft stopping. That's going to, and it's been in the code forever, that's going to do things like reduce airflow through the house. Okay. Your um, plumbers and, uh, and some of them are still your friends and my HVAC contractors would come through the house with their sawzalls and blow huge holes through my rafters and everything like that. Then I would then have to fill uh, and to make sure that there's no air flowing through the house. So all that, all that, um, that, that cap, that's, those smart people left the marketplace. And the builders kind of woke up in, say, 2010 and started to come back into the marketplace. <coughs> While that great recession was happening, we had a couple things going on with the codes, all the codes, not just the energy code. We had an increase in the uh, level of stringency in the codes, starting from the 2006 codes, primarily, going to the 2009 edition of the ICC codes. 2012 and 2015. Now, when I was building houses, this is the model energy code. I worked. On, I used an earlier version. I won't say what. Um, and this was the cable one and two family dwelling code. This is the residential code that I used to build my houses, and this is the energy code that I used to follow. These fit in the, the glove compartment of my pickup truck. Um, so now today we have the 2015 international residential code. compared to the cable one and the family calling code. This is a home, this is a far superior code than this other code. Homes are safer because of it. But you can see the level of complexity now that home builders have to deal with. And remember that pie chart where buildings are fit in the scheme of priorities? Um, and this is the 19, 2015 energy code, okay, compared to the old energy code. I'm not, I just need to 
create awareness around what the builders face. So they woke up in 2010, uh, had lost other talent, uh, and uh, had to design buildings to make them energy efficient, and they've got these new colors, and they're trying to figure out what's going on with those new colors. And they're trying to rebuild their old intellectual capital. Also, their old set of plans that they've had in the drawer for a couple of years, that they pulled, pulled out of the drawer and blew the dust off, and their old specifications, they try to go ahead and let's go ahead and build a subdivision now that's been collected dust for a couple of years. Uh, now they have to redesign all their plans and figure out not only for energy, but sprinklers, and like safety, electrical, and plumbing things. So, for the context of the home builder, they're backpedaling and feel a little bit overwhelmed as they're coming out from this great recession. So, there's a tie in here, both to the Building America program, which is a huge, huge resource for home builders, and also the code compliance effort that DOE is taking, that I, I prefer to call the code education and awareness type of program. Um, we'll get, I'll get to those two things later. I need to give you that picture for the builders who are backpedaling a little bit, feeling overwhelmed. And they're looking around looking for someone to help provide a resource for them. The Building America program, I served on some of the peer review committees many years ago, um, where uh, the Building America partners would come with their great ideas on how to do an unvented act. Not a very sexy, cool, shiny, cool thing to do. I mean, it doesn't grab people's attention like solar or some of these cool widgets that we saw in some of the, our uh, presentations. But they're critically, critically important how to do, how to appropriately design HVAC equipment, uh, do unvented attics and crawl spaces and, and design wall systems that are forgiving and kind of breathe and are smart wall systems. That's all important work to get done. So for the, for the uh, home builder, the Building America uh, program is a third party trust advisor. Here's why, I'm a building product manufacturer. I probably have some peers in the room who are building product or equipment manufacturers and watching on video. Um, I'm again, recovering home builder. When a, a manufacturer came to me and said, hey, I've got this new product. It's really great, you should use it in your home. Um, builders have two things in their head that are running constant. A cost calculator and a risk uh, calculator. What's my risk? So uh, I, as a manufacturer, sometimes run into that subconscious thinking of the home builder. And sometimes there's not a lot of trust. Because maybe they've been uh, had a regrettable situation in prior technology. I look to the Building America program selfishly as I can bring this third party trusted advisor in and they can be the facilitator and buffer between me and the home builder to try to integrate this technology or system or multiple technologies, how to make all these things work together in a house and make sure there's no defects or, or issues. That's that's how why I love and my peers love the Building America program. So the act as a buffer between the, the builder is very, very risk averse and kind of has that I don't trust you kind of attitude from some builders, from some many product manufacturers. Um, also, what the Building America program does is, so what I would have sometimes when I was building houses, uh, someone would come by and drop a piece of literature off of me and say, hey, this is how you do it, and they were gone. I, never, I couldn't find them again. So what the Building America team did was, you know, take that literature and actually hold the hands of the home builder, not only their, their, their framers and all their different trades, and walk their trades to how, actually how you integrate the system into the building practice. So um, it, it forced the product manufacturer to step back and look at the product, uh, to see if it's appropriate, look at their installation requirements, and it forced that building product manufacturer to rethink their practices. It also then forced the home builder to rethink their practices, take a little bit of the risk and anxiety of moving from their practice that their father did and their grandfather did and move to something different. So boots on the ground is critically important. Uh, having a webinar and having uh, literature on a website doesn't cut it. You have to have boots on the ground to help the builders do that. Also, we also have it in that organically that happens in the whole process, unintended consequences is that these Building America teams say, hey, you know, this is how you might want to frame your wall. But this is how you might want to do waterproofing and dampening. So these other ancillary benefits that come out of the Building America program. Um, and actually, for larger builders, there's fear in moving from one spec to another. So once they fine tune the specification or practice, then they can bring it into their mainstream, into their uh, uh, portfolio of offering nationwide, provided it's a good fit for the certain clients. So in terms of scaling, we really need to get the scale. So the 
does look good putting the technology in a cute little uh, case study on, a, on the website, and two builders use it. You've got to find a way for multiple builders to use that. And all the designs really have to be planted, zone specific, and application specific. That's a whole other challenging issue. So that's the Building America team and the, and the safety net and kind of the risk mitigation tool that I see in Building America. I'm going to switch now to the kind of code compliance effort that I think is kind of heroic of uh, the DOE is going in that direction. Because many years ago, I used to look at things like uh, builder practice. So I would get the building practice data from the NHB Research Center. I would then uh, analyze uh, what products I was shipping into a marketplace. By channel, by what marketplace. And that's called, called SKU analysis. And I can see that building practice is here. Code might be here. And I'm still shipping into a product into the marketplace. I probably shouldn't be shipping into the marketplace, which tells me I have an opportunity through education and awareness of the marketplace to educate builders what type of products they should be using. Coincidentally, I ran into my friends in the HVAC industry and the window industry, and we had the same issue. Now, this is to say that builders are intentionally and willingly knowingly violating code. That's not the case. Right, let's go back to our pie chart I talked about earlier on. In terms of the scheme of things that are on your list, code is a minor issue. For the most part, all houses are generally very, very safe and well built today. Particularly with respect to the context of our existing housing stock, today's houses are really, really superior to our existing housing stock, superior to the house I live in right now. But uh, the thing that we have to learn, and I think DOE has learned and evolved in their thinking on the code compliance effort, you can't have an I gotcha code compliance effort. Because that's a relationship destroyer. So going back to my days of remodeling, working both with code officials and uh, spouses and families to try to get to this jujitsu to get everybody to the same outcome where we remain friends and build relationships is critically important. So education and awareness through coaching and mentoring. So you've got education and awareness and the coaching and mentoring that can happen as a companion to the Building America team on the ground, not only to builders, but to building departments. Uh, because building departments, um, these building code officials kind of have a thankless job. Uh, to be fair to my building code official friends, uh, the home builders are screaming, looking for their plans, get approvals right away. Like, Come on, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Uh, some city official is then calling them, saying, "Where are those? Where's that approval for that subdivision plan?" Um, and then they're out in the field, having to cover so many jobs with limited resources, really constrained on doing a good job on job sites as best they can. Sometimes they're not even allowed to do building inspections because they don't have any um, uh, approval to do that. A large majority of jurisdictions in this country do not do plan review for the energy code. That's your first line of defense when you go to build, get a permit. There's no plan review for energy code. And there's no field inspection for the energy code. So it is kind of running to tackle that thing. So that's why DOE pivoting from code development is pretty good where we are in coach right now. Some would argue that we're beyond best practice, but we're beyond minimum standard of care and best practice. My friends at home should say that. And now it's time to kind of mop up and go towards what I call the fiction in terms of the forecast of what all these energy codes are delivering, because they're not. I know that's that's uh, really probably bad news and for some of my friends in the energy efficiency community. I gotta pull back the curve and say that's fiction. Um, so uh, education and awareness, and I think what happens in this process, because I walk this walk myself, trying to get uh, the marketplace corrected, and stepping on a bunch of landmines and making mistakes, you know, through that process you gain a lot of humility. Uh, as uh, I think the Department of Energy is going to gain a lot of humility with respect to what works and doesn't work in the codes, uh, what they do and don't know about what impacts the marketplace, and they're also going to build a lot of relationships on the way. A really, really important network of fabric connections between the building departments, code officials, and state agencies. Finally, we're going to get compliance gains that are, I think, are very, very, very significant. And we'll actually you know, get back to realizing what we, we should have seen in the code for many, many years. So um, I think that the journey on code compliance is at least a decade long. Uh, we've got some marketplaces that are very, very sophisticated in terms of building practice. Uh, we've got some that are just you know, have a little bit longer to go, and that's okay because there'll be marketplaces you need. I want to close by talking again, bracketing my whole story around the Building America program being about risk aversion, it mitigates the risk of the home builder because.
because there's a lot of product, de there's a lot of defect litigation out there, and builders are risk averse, and they have a good reason to be. So it's our job to make their job transition to better building practices, much, much better. The Building America program is a safety net for the builders. It gives them a little bit of safe harbor to in make incremental moves towards better building practices. And it's a huge relationship that leads to it. On the code education side, my friends in the energy advocacy area need to have a better understanding and appreciation of what's on the builder's plate. Going back to that pie chart of what they are there help to and finding ways to uh, be better partners at helping them help the builders educate uh, themselves and meet the code. Um, and finally, the DOE is going to learn a lot, and as all we are, about what works and doesn't work. And maybe we'll see enhancements to the codes in the future, as opposed to maybe increases, maybe there'll be more flexibility. So that's been my journey as a builder, as a designer, as a building product manufacturer who wasn't trusted when I got to the job site, and a member of a peer review committee for the Building America team, and then participating in with some home builders on, the, on you know, integrating new technologies. And uh, these are really, really important programs to fund. And uh, you know, it, is, it, is, it is critically important because we've gone from this thin book to a really thick book. And when we have that, that's just an opportunity for a lot of risk and failures from home builders. And guess what? The, the energy code is going to get blamed if they're failures. So it's our insurance policy to build the American program to go ahead and make sure builders don't, don't have those stuff. Thank you, Jay. And I should mention, uh, I don't think I did before, that we, I'll give you guys a, an opportunity to ask questions at the end of all our session, all, all our speakers. Um, for those of us in the policy world, we need to stay in touch with reality, with the boots on the ground. Um, because it, it is what's happening. Um, when I talk about building policy uh, or the building industry, I like to sort of look at it as this continuum of innovation and people are at different places and we have all the ecosystem that Roland showed, all those the things are helping uh, along the way with R&D, the training and education, the um, uh, uh, the uh, best practices, the, you know, moving into the market, financing is a huge issue, public education. Um, and there are uh, the codes that are the legal minimum, and they have a prescription path or prescriptive path that's, you know, this is what you should do, and, and they also have a performance path. So those, learning those best practices helps builder they you know they see the goal and they can use their judgment and their smarts and work with their partners to reach that goal and so that is I would just like to say a, a benefit of voluntary standards and some of the programs that we're seeing on net zero energy green building rating system that helps builders uh, and designers go even above code and, and keep pushing the envelope. And DOE helps with that as well. So, um, so thank you, Jay, for that uh, so much. So we've heard the DOE overview of the programs, industry's perspective, and now I'm delighted to introduce our uh, congressional representative, Adam Rosenberg. Um, Adam is Democratic staff member for the Energy Subcommittee of the House uh, Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, which he joined in 2013. And Dr. Rosenberg holds a BS in Applied and Engineering Physics from Cornell University and a PhD in Plasma Physics from Princeton. And I can't pronounce the next couple of lines on what he uh, studied, so <laughs> I won't go there. But. Uh, while an undergraduate, he also completed internships at Argonne National Laboratory and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, and he was a AAAS Congressional Fellow. 
uh, on the Democratic staff of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, he uh, has worked on, for that committee, the Department of Commerce Advanced Technology Program, and um, the, uh, uh, then worked in DOE as manager of the uh, Office of Science's Fusion Energy Sciences Program. And he also, uh, uh, prior to this position, served as deputy director of, uh, for technology strategy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for operational energy plans and programs, um, and coordinated with DOE um, and DOD on deployment of advanced energy technologies for military applications. And I think we all know the critical sort of mission, uh, uh, critical uh, functions that, that energy plays. So Adam, thank you so much for being here, and I'll hand it over to you. I, I think the word you're looking for is magnetohydrodynamics, <laughs> which has an awful lot to do with building technologies. Um, yeah, that's that's the funny thing about uh, being a congressional staff member uh, is you can uh, have a technical expertise um, or some slice of it and be considered an expert in all of science and all of technology. <laughs> so here I am. Um, so our committee, uh, the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, has jurisdiction over all um, unclassified energy research, development, demonstration, and commercialization activities carried out by the Department of Energy. We also have uh, voluntary consensus-based standards. So we have um, an awful lot of the um, building technologies offices programs uh, under our jurisdiction. Um, now, uh, as many of you probably know, there hasn't been major legislation um, on energy efficiency that's actually made it all the way to a president's desk since the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007. Um, there were um, a number of significant provisions in there, uh, many of which moved through our committee including um, a commercial high-performance green buildings program, uh, zero net energy commercial buildings initiative, and a high-performance green federal buildings program. Um, so um, there's, at this point, it's now been over eight years, um, and there's some, I think, pent-up interest in um, not just energy efficiency or building technologies, but across the board for um, for perhaps a, a broad, comprehensive um, energy bill. Um, uh, we have now um, the same party uh, in the majority of both the House and Senate. It's not the one I work for, but um, it still offers uh, unique opportunities to pass major legislation. Um, and there is bipartisan and bicameral interest, as um, many of you um, may be aware, in, uh, in the area of energy efficiency. Um, uh, you have um, certainly the um, Shaheen Portman bill in the Senate that many are familiar with and, and here in the House. Um, I believe it's uh, Mr. Welch and Mr. McKinley are working um, similar uh, uh, companion legislation. Um, but what you've also seen is given the nature of the Senate, um, small bills don't seem to move the way they move here. Um, so, I, you know, you, you might expect a Welch-McKinley bill um, to pass or, um, say, a, a narrower um, energy efficiency research and development bill could pass the House, but um, it sounds like the way that, that all of these things are ultimately going to become law um, is through a major energy bill. Um, now, I can't guarantee that something passes in this Congress, but um, I think uh, a lot of folks in the right positions are certainly going to try to make it happen. Um, now, as for the, the current budget request, um, I can certainly speak for, um, for my bosses um, that we are very supportive of um, the request for the Building Technologies Office. Um, uh, but uh, there are obviously some challenges that have emerged um, year after year. Unfortunately, as, as Roland pointed out, the um, 
funding line appears to be going down when in our perspective it sh should be going in the opposite direction. Um, we had a hearing with the um, Secretary of Energy testifying um, about uh, three weeks ago um, in our committee and what you saw was what I would characterize um, as kind of an unfair and, and um, unjustified comparison of, of total funding and growth for, for EERE um, um, versus, um, say, fossil energy and, and nuclear energy. Now, um, we are very supportive of the fossil energy and nuclear energy budgets as well, um, and uh, we certainly support uh, growth and research in those areas um, as well. But um, there, there seem to be sort of a, if you, a comparison to um, a the total budget line for for EERE versus fossil energy. Now EERE funds, um, as Roland showed in his chart, about you know ten different renewable energy technologies, um, several different um, major energy efficiency programs, not just building technologies but advanced manufacturing, uh, FEMP, um, and uh, transportation as well. Um, and and, and uh, there's a whole lot of of exciting um, research areas going on in, in the transportation sector. So, um, uh, Secretary Moniz really pointed out that the EERE budget is 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 more like three budgets. It's it's not. It doesn't really make sense to just say EERE gets this level. Why isn't fossil energy getting that that um, that same level? Um, even beyond that, um, it, you. You get the arguments on um, "quote unquote" picking winners and losers, um, which uh, we fundamentally reject um, when you're talking about research funding. Um, we don't think that argument makes sense. That's that's uh, oh, the government should not be picking "quote unquote" winners and losers in sort of which technologies get more funding. Well, we don't fund perpetual motion machines. We don't fund. Uh, we, we should not necessarily be putting money towards technologies that the private sector is going to carry out on its own. Um, the unique role of the government is um, to look at opportunity areas that um, the private sector is not picking up or will not be picking up very quickly um, to meet national needs, um, whether they be economic or environmental um, or, or energy security needs for that matter. So. Um, uh, yeah, if you looked at the opening statements or some of the questions or s from some members in uh, the hearing with Secretary Muniz, it's um, these, these points on picking winners and losers and um, while renewable energy or en and, and granted we're talking about energy efficiency here, which um, they weren't picking on quite as much, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, renewable energy only makes up, you know, a, a few percent of our power um, uh, power consumption, whereas um, fossil and nuclear will make up, you know, the vast majority. Why aren't we putting more research into those incumbent technologies? Which kind of is a intellectual disconnect from from my perspective, anyway. Um, and it's something that we're going to have to fight um, to have meaningful. Um, meaningful investments uh, in energy efficiency as well as renewable energy. Um, furthermore, um, when you actually talk to my counterparts at the staff level um, or, or, on the, or um, uh, some folks in the Senate, um, there seems to be an understanding or, or more of an appreciation, more of a bipartisan appreciation as I laid out before on, on on uh, energy efficiency investments. There's, there's less of an appreciation um, by some of my counterparts for renewable energy investments, but um, we ha can agree to disagree on that. But nevertheless, um, a line of attack we often hear is, is on the whole EERE request and, and, and something often not distinguishing between those individual components. And that's going to be problematic as uh, we move forward both in um, the um, FY 2016 appropriations process as well as a development of meaningful legislation um, that hopefully makes it into um, an energy bill. So 
there are opportun there are opportunities. There seems to be um, from some of the more um, more thinking members, the less knee jerk folks, um, a, a an appreciation for um, for energy efficiency investments made by the the federal government. But um, uh, you're still going to have to fight the stupid every single day. Um, so uh, with that cheery note, um, I, I would just like to say, given that there are, um, there, there may well be these opportunities um, that are, um, present themselves in this Congress, um, we certainly on, on uh, the Democratic staff of the House Science, Space, and Tech Committee welcome any good ideas that anyone in this room has or anyone on this panel has for, for meaningful, helpful um, legislation in uh, the energy efficiency area. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, and I wanted just to mention one thing before I open it up for questions, and that is, um, you know, it's interesting and sad and definitely a concern to hear how, uh, it, and I think it's an educational process to, to show that many of these programs, not just the, you know, programs in building technologies that work together, but in EERE, the stuff that's going on in solar is going to be helping the folks in buildings create these net zero energy buildings, these buildings that, uh, that produce as much energy on site from renewable resources uh, as they use in a year. So they're net zero. Um, that's at least one simple definition. But so just with that, it's, it, it's all... It's all part of this. It's all critical. So um, I do want to invite your questions. And I think we have some wonderful resources here. And so we can help look at the budget. And if you have questions. This question, my name's Kevin Foley, and my question is directed to Roland. Roland, I'm with a company called Sika Corporation, and um, I'm in charge of the federal marketing of their commercial roofs, and have worked with your office, not necessarily you, for years since the Energy Star program developed. And I was looking at your slide, um, I don't know what number it is here, but it says benefits, FOA, fiscal year 16, technologies and energy savings targets, and you still list commercial roofs of like a 0.12 quad, um, can you tell me, is there any continuing research going on with the commercial roofs? And then, uh, as a follow-up question to that, if you could expand on the research you're doing about, um, you had shown Dow uh, making like um, air sealers, it looked like. Thank you. Sure. So, great question. So, the, the benefit FOA, which uh, I showed you the slide on the, the spend, there's a piece of that which does allow funding for roofs. So when we, all the topics on there, what we did is we've got something called a prioritization tool. We took about 600 technologies that are potentially used in residential and commercial buildings. And we went and we got all the data we could find on them, on their, the technology, the technical potential, the market potential. And that's all in this massive database that we use to inform how we set our goals. So. Obviously, uh, roofs are one place where a lot of energy leaves a building, and as is the foundation and the walls and the windows, but for the envelope. Uh, so what we're saying in this particular FOA, which uh, has obviously it's 16, we're going to define what goals we want. We're going to describe what sort of things we want, and then we're going to evaluate proposals coming in from the market um, to fund. Because that's, I mean, that's the whole point is we don't have all the best ideas. We're trying to reach out and say, who's got some great ideas that will help us solve some of these? The project you, you mentioned with Dow was one that uh, you know, came out of one of these FOAs where we were looking at uh, ceiling. Uh, one of the issues for, for builders is 
they get somebody, you know, they can punch a hole through the exterior wall by their doing something they shouldn't have been. Maybe it's the plumber. Could have been who been who knows what cable guy. cable guy. Or it could be that the framing around that corner of the building, around the window, is so difficult that they can't seal it very well with the whatever technology they're using. So we said we want some simpler, easier to apply solutions. And uh, there have been some spray-on solutions in the past. They haven't worked as well as we wanted. This one's a water-based solution. It's a uh, uh, elastomer, uh, sprays on, it'll fill a quarter inch gap, up to a quarter inch gap. And uh, we've found that it's easy to apply once you know how to do it. Of course, that's part of the trick is knowing how to do it. And so that's the kind of solutions we want. Then it came, it, it now goes to like the Building America program for the exact thing that uh, Jay was talking about when he was saying, how do we make it easier for builders to apply it? It also works for retrofitters as well. It's residential and commercial. Uh, where we're using it right now is we actually, uh, we have a project with China. You probably know that the building industry in China hasn't had quite the same downturn that we have. They have a pretty robust uh, uh, construction industry going on. And so we decided this was a great technology to get to them early because they're building so many buildings. And when you build a commercial building, it lasts for 50 years. So we actually put it into our uh, research program between the U.S. and China and uh, Dow is actually testing it in commercial buildings so that we can see how it works in the Chinese market. So we've got, you know, that's good for Dow in sales. It's good for the global climate. Uh, we, we're still trying to figure out what's the best way to get scale in the U.S. So is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess the last part of the question I have is, is do you put out an advertisement to Dow's world? Great, great question. Is there any other there will be there's going to be multiple of them, of them in 16 if we get funded. So we do. So you know, I bet you all read the Federal Register every day religiously, <laughs> right? <laughs> Good gosh, it is the worst place to find out any information. Yet that's our required mechanism. Now what we do is we collect names of people who are interested in funding. And we've got a database that's just what we keep. We put it in the Federal Register. That's what we have to do. We have it on our website. Of course, I'm sure you go there every day. Um, and, but if you get on the list, that's the solution. Because then you're guaranteed to get something. I wish there was an easier way to tell people about this. Uh, there really isn't. Um, I love an idea on how to do that. It's, uh, I mean, other folks might be able to help us with getting that information out. But we're pretty clear on... Like, up front, we're telling you what we're interested in for FY16. And then the challenge I have, um, and, and maybe Adam can tell me more about this, the way the challenge I have is my goal, because I've got a fiscal year uh, is different from a calendar year. So my fiscal year starts October 1. My goal is to have these funding opportunities on the street October 1 or within a couple of weeks, so I have the maximum time to get that uh, results uh, work, you know, select the, the winners, get them funded, and get them working, which is, bottom line is get them working. Challenge I have is if I don't have a budget by October 1, I then am I'm in a different game. So the game I'm in is a continuing resolution is usually where we are. And with a continuing resolution, my challenge is I can, while the budget may be previous year budget with some 10% reduction, my spend plan has to be the lower of the House or Senate mark. Because if they were to end up getting a budget, I can't have overspent. So while my budget number may look bigger, my effective number is very much smaller. And so when I put my FOAs out, I have to say, I can't put this out. There's, I might not have enough money when there's a budget. So it's a very strange uh, mechanism. So. Uh, I'm sure Adam doesn't want to comment on that. It's, it's really sort of the way the it's the way it works. I mean, they have no other choice. They don't know what their budget's going to be, and I have no other choice. I don't know what it's going to be either. So I'm describing some of the constraints, which limits our ability to be clear up front and then follow through uh, with the delivery on the the funding that uh, we'd like to do. Is that 
Yep. For 16. Yes, that list of like six, there's three of them in, I don't know which page you're on, but there's uh, the big, the list I had on page, it was like the uh, page six. On six, there was, um, there were six funding, big funding areas, three of them in emerging tech, and one in commercial, one in residential building America, and one in codes for this uh, education around uh, 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 codes. Then if you look on page eight, assuming you have the same deck, on eight there's the one of the three emerging tech funding opportunities has a list of technologies that we're focused on. And that has water heating, <coughs> controls, air sealing, which might be in the space you're talking about, uh, daylighting, commercial, this is a glasses problem, commercial roofs, so that may be where you are. So that's part of one of the six announcements and we will list within that one, these are the technologies we're interested in this round. And then in 17 would be a different set and 18 would be a different set. Does that help? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sheila Kupai um, with Biomass Thermal Energy Council. And I have a question um, specifically um, for you, Mr. Risser, but I guess any of you guys can have input as well. And um, it's specifically addressing looking at, uh, looking at thermal energy, um, seeing as it consumes about one third of our nation's energy and almost 40% in the Northeast area. Where do you see, um, specifically looking in DOE's perspective, um, renewable heat fit into the um, BTO FY16 budget? I know there was a lot of um, mentioning from each of, um, each of you in regards to renewables. Um, however, specifically looking at renewable heat, like heating and cooling, and my second fold of that question is who would you know, in the industry, who would want to talk to at DOE regarding um, renewable heating, since um, much of the focus there is on other renewables. Okay, so I'll, I'll see if I can answer that. There's a lot of levels to that question. So first, there's obviously an interest in thermal energy storage within the building as a component of, particularly if you've got solar or some other renewable source of generation, you want to store it somehow. So we, we are looking at, at to what extent can the building become a thermal storage battery for energy. So that's, that's one aspect. It's not a big spend because there's uh, some, we don't have a big budget and you know, there's a lot of problems we're trying to solve here. I think more to your point is uh, sort of the HVAC world. I'll give you the examples of what we're doing there. So we've got um, heat pump technology which takes heat out of your clothes washer and puts it into your dryer and takes the waste heat out of your dryer and puts it into your water heater. So it's really, it's, we, we call it you know, integrated systems because the point is otherwise each one of those dumps the heat uh, at some point on that cycle. So it involves changing the way the builder builds the home as part of the challenge, because they've got to rethink that. But we're first showing what is the potential benefits of that. And there are some significant ones. Now, there's another part of your question, which is what type of heat exchanger are you using? And the heat exchangers we use today are pretty um, old technology. Uh, examples are what you've got in your car. You drive down the road and air blows across a heat exchanger. Well, your air conditioner is almost the same, except you're outside and you blow a fan and blows across the fence. Those are uh, not particularly exciting heat exchangers. You've got one in your refrigerator. Again, you, you put the cooling fluid out on the backside and you have exchange of air with the, uh, the heated um, uh, cooling fluid and then you do exchange. So, We've spent time on some totally new heat exchangers. And I'll, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about these, but some of these are revolutionary. So one of them is, I mean, uh, you've got a physics background. So if you go back to the Navier-Stokes equations for heat exchange, 
there's a component in that equation that says motion. Well, in these cases, these are static systems. The heat exchange is a fin which doesn't move and just air blows across it. Well, the, I should have brought one with me, but there's a technology that we helped develop, which is a rotor. And the rotor has a series of fins on it. And it sits on top of the heat source. And, you, and why didn't we do this 40 years ago? It's because when you have something spinning, you have a gap between the heat source and the spinning object, and that gap creates a thermal barrier, which means you're not as efficient. Well, the technology that's been developed has a one one thousandth of an inch gap, which when it spins up, it rises up like the uh, hard drive on your computer, it spins about the same speed, and the cooling is about 30 times more effective. So where's that being used? Uh, it's now been licensed to six companies, uh, the problem is, you license it to a company, so it's like the building industry. I've got these companies saying, we love this, this is super cool, we want to put it into our product. What do you think that product life cycle is? It's a long time, because it it they have to completely redesign their products. But they're doing it. So I'm giving you examples of there's a new technology there. There's a new one we're trying to, to move forward, which is a totally radical design for air conditioners. We have it conceptually, we believe it works. We have not had the money to fund it at scale, to sort of build it up so it could prove that out. So we've got some really great new solutions on heat exchange. Um, one of the things we're trying to do in 15 is to start playing out a few of those. I don't know what our budget's gonna be um, in 16, but if we continue on that path, we will continue developing novel, innovative heat exchange opportunities that create greater opportunities for what you're describing. Long answer to a short question. Oh, by the way, that technology, you can look it up. If you Google Sandia cooler or Sandia rotary heat exchanger, I think it says cooler, it'll show you what it is and you'll be amazed at what they've done. Sandia did it. Uh, the funny story about this, they came to us and said, would you fund this? And we said, well, this seems a little earlier stage than we usually fund. We usually fund things a little closer to the market. And we said, well, who'd you talk to? And they said, we talked to DARPA and they said it was too innovative for them. They didn't think it would work. So I said, I'm all in. And sure enough, it's now, I mean, it's a huge success. The, the team that built this, it was one guy, is now 15 people because it's got, they've got so much interest and it's going so many different places. Um, I just need a point of clarification from Mr. Risser. Um, <clears throat> we leapt about 30% in terms of energy efficiency from the 2006 to the 2012 IECC. I was actually the co-author of that proposal with Ron Majette. So what you're saying is either, and I'm confused, I'm confused about a lot of things in life, but this in particular. Um, I'm confused about are you going after an additional 20% or are you going after an additional 50% and are you doing that through development or through education and compliance? Okay, so this, this really was not a codes uh, topic. Uh, the codes, the 30%, what we believe is, and that was in two steps. So the, the codes efficiency, we believe, I think Jay said it correctly, we believe that what's out there is a good place for the code. We don't believe the market is adopt, is is implementing it, and so why push the envelope further until you help them get there? So we're really trying to figure out how to make it lower risk, easier to implement, so we actually capture that 30%, which we don't believe is actually happening. It's just theoretical. So now let's go to the 50%. The 50% was based upon um, a couple things. First, technology development. So remember when I started, I said we use a prioritization methodology to figure this out. We calculate, it's not quite 50%, it's about 46 or something, based upon our investments in the technologies in our portfolio, where we think it'll go by 2020. Now, my staff says 46 is not 50, and I say, well, 50 sounds better. And, uh, and, and, it, and it's just, it sounds better, doesn't it? And, <laughs> and, and I like to have a stretch, because you know, if you just tell them, okay, you've shown me exactly how you're gonna get there, it, it, doesn't create as much creativity and, and innovation that I'd like to see in, in the thinking on this. So we're, so the technologies are gonna get us to the 50% of opportunity. Now let's talk about actual savings. 
the way we get uh, the majority of our savings is actually in standards. And the standards, the reason that occurs is because when you set that level for standards, you can't buy something less efficient. And so the way that works, and codes is different. You have a lot of paths to get there. You want flexibility. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of factors we could, we could talk about. It's not that it's not important, but with standards, it's absolute. And it's got to be cost effective. The example I'll give you is when I got to DOE, the commercial air conditioner was less efficient than the minimum standard for residential. I said, what's with that? There's, Walmart has 30 of them on every store, and yet we've got, yeah, why is it less efficient than you, than you could buy for a home? And they said, well, you could go after this, but it'll take you probably eight, 10 years to fix it. And I said, okay, well, I come from the market. So, I mean, standards I know, but I come from the market side. I said, let's approach this differently. I went out and I figured out what are the technology innovations in the commercial air conditioning space that could be aggregated into one new product. We then vetted that with all the national labs that worked in the space, came up with a set. We brought in Macy's, Sears, Walmart, Target, McDonald's, all the folks that buy those commercial air conditioners on your roof, they sat down and they said, well, we don't want to go to the bleeding edge of technology. We want to go something back because the cost will be more reasonable. We picked a spot that was a reasonable place. It's about 50% more efficient than anything they could buy. They then went to the manufacturers and said, this is what we want to buy if you build it at the right price. One of the manufacturers, one of the major ones on the list that I showed you earlier, said, this isn't going anywhere. You know, they don't want that. Two of the others said, we're all in. And the products came on the market. The third one called me down to their headquarters and said, holy cow, <laughs> we have a problem here. How do we get back on the game? Uh, the point being, they're being sold today. And right now, the proposal for commercial air conditioner standards takes that into account which didn't take me 10 years, because I've only been here five. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? Hi, uh, Stan Colby. I'm with the Sheet Metal Air Conditioning Contractors. We have commercial, industrial, and uh, public contractors working on this building and about every other one around. Um, yeah, you a couple of things that are coming out in the energy bills that I'm kind of interested in your opinion. One is benchmarking. And the other is uh, building energy performance uh, contracting, which both, I think, bring the kind of accountability into the process that really puts not only the systems and the technology that you're putting in buildings, but really the installation and the engineering all together. What we see is, some, you know, talk about rewarding energy, uh, winners and losers, we reward losers, and we reward losing uh, adaptations and losing companies who put this technology in buildings don't connect it, you have system leakage, it's phenomenal on high efficiency equipment. The owner never gets the uh, efficiency that he pays for. And where benchmarking comes in is I think a lot of owners are not even aware the, about the operation of the building that they pay millions of dollars for. And by having benchmarking, um, you, you, know, you set the standard and then you tie your leasing program as the government to a certain number and then you say, you guys can have anyone work on your buildings you want you can take full tax credits for, do, for implementing technology incorrectly You just because you take the expense of the, of the retrofit and you write it off, whether it's done right or not. Um, but anyway, the benchmarking seems to put accountability and performance contracting puts the contractor on the hook for did he do the project as, as prescribed and as promised, and if he didn't, uh, then he has to pay you know, the difference out of his own pocket. So rather than make excuses for people who have complexity, the code's thick, maybe they didn't go to study engineering, maybe they didn't hire someone that could explain it to them, why other companies have that. Um, it seems better to have a standard for the building's operation, and if a contractor meets that, obviously um, he's in, and if he doesn't, then he wouldn't be preferred for future work. But I was really curious about your view of benchmarking and what it can offer and performance contracting and what it can offer to save the government and also kind of reward the companies who do things right. 
may take first step. So performance contract, I think it's a huge opportunity. And I think uh, one of the things that needs to happen in that space is they need to expand what's possible for performance contract. And right now there's some constraints that limit what you can do in that area. And I can tell you from my from the federal standpoint, because my best friend is uh, runs FEMP, and uh, let me tell you, he struggles with that daily for federal facilities. So I think I think they need to expand what can be done in that performance contracting space. So it's okay for ESCOs to do more than they do today. Right now, it's it's fairly constrained by the risk factor that uh, is there. Uh, benchmarking, I'll come back to. Let me tell you a quick story that gets at what you said about uh, performance. I think this would be very informative. So NREL put in a new research facility. It's three buildings, and you know there are their ERE's lab. And we said, let's get a performance contract in place. Where well, the architecture engineering firm that got the job said, are you kidding? Uh, we don't want a performance contract. We don't know how to. You know, how can we hold anybody accountable for anything? So here's what they did. First thing is they brought their expertise to the table, and they helped them understand what they could do. But the and that was important, but it wasn't important for round two. It was only important for round one. The important thing for round one was money. It's money. So what they said to the A&E firm, they said, if you deliver a building that meets this performance level, we will double your fee. Now, you might think, oh, holy, whatever, doubling your fee? Their fee is nothing compared to the price of the building. It's a fraction. It's just in the noise. But for that company, that was the big driver. That was a huge driver because their fee is everything, right? The rest is just cost. Well, the first building they built, they met the performance target. It was the same price as building that building without that performance uh, element. And the way they did it was they put the exact same requirement on every single sub that worked on that project. And they, the subs came in, the one that did the data center said, well, you don't mean us. They said, you're part of the building, we mean you. The food service center said, you don't mean us. And they said, no, if you're part of the building, you're gonna do it too. And they all said it never happened, it did. The second building was done, it beat uh, the, the performance expectation at a lower cost, and the third one at an even lower cost. So they actually drove down the cost after they got experience with it. They got performance they were looking for, and their subs and the A&E firm is now trying to do this on every job going forward because they got more money. Uh, you asked about benchmarking. I think benchmarking is really important. I think it should be voluntary. People get scared if they think it's uh, mandatory. I think right now the, the key is to give them information that allows them to make the right decisions for the right reasons. And today we don't have common decision metrics for a building owner to even know how their building should perform or, or could perform. Uh, so I, I think it's, it has a huge value in, in uh, managing and operating buildings. I don't know if anyone wants to say anything. I think, uh, uh, Jay, on the residential side, Similar issues. Um, we're looking for the commercial industry to kind of lead on both benchmarking and whatnot, but and commissioning. But we're starting to see a little bit of hybrid of commissioning right now in the residential side with the, with the introduction. We'll get better market penetration at the home energy rate. Who's typically on a house and doing lower door and diagnostics on the home um, for energy efficiency? So it's less, I think, it's this in terms of energy efficiency, and it's getting more precise. Now, my experience in the uh, energy retrofit of existing homes has was around all this modeling and all this projected uh, energy efficiency savings, when really we need to get to the electric meter and the gas meters and acid test of whether so we're really saving money. Um, and you know, on the going back to the residential side, the, uh, the National Association of Homes which has a research lab, a home innovation lab that has a whole quality program. And that's really getting into integration around, um, you know, getting best practices in their construction techniques. And the big builders and some leading builders are integrating that into the whole mechanism. And, you know, energy efficiency goes along for the ride of that. So uh, we're going to get labeling on homes. It's probably going to be too voluntary and not legislative anytime soon because of different interests. But, you know, the big builders want to show that their home looks much better than the one I reside in because their competition is 
house where I live in. All right. Thank you all. I don't know if I have a microphone, but thank you all so much for being here. And, um, oh, and Stan, thank you for that question. Uh, performance is everything. It's, it's what, we're, what we're talking about. The challenges that we have in terms of uh, energy use, the savings we need to have, the environmental issues. Um, we can have all the programs in the world, but if it doesn't save energy at the end of the day, we're, we're not doing anything. So I think it's huge. Uh, Roland, you mentioned decision metrics, um, or Jay, you just mentioned it. I think that is critical. People need to sort of know what's possible and then um, how to measure it. So we need metrics, we need tools, um, and uh, we need to see this. And so I think there's a lot of uh, good work underway, and we need to keep pushing on that. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, DOE has a great uh, list of resources on the budget on energy.gov. Um, very, very detailed uh, information about Building Technologies Office. I think it's, if you, if you want to get into the weeds, it's, it's really good information. Um, and we also have some handouts, you know, on the budget. And if you have any questions that you think of later, um, shoot them our way, send me an email. Um, if I can't answer it, I'll be happy to find out for you. And thanks again for being here. And thank you so much to our wonderful panel. Appreciate you guys for being here. <laughs>